Welcome to the online ministry of Park Street Baptist Church of Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. We wish you could attend in person, but trust that God will bless you through the music and the study of His Word. Thank you for joining us. My heart was distressed beneath Jehovah's red crown, and lo, in the pit where my sins dragged me down, I cried to the Lord from the deep my clay, who tenderly brought me out to golden day. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. He puts a song in my soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. He placed me upon the strong rock by his side. My steps were established, and here I'll abide. No danger of falling, where here I remain. But stand by his grace until the crown I gain. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. He puts a song in my soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. He gave me a song, t'was a new song of praise. By day and by night, these sweet notes I will raise. My heart's overflowing, I'm happy and free. I'll praise my Redeemer who has rescued me. song in my soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. I'll sing of His wonderful mercy to me, I'll praise Him till all men His goodness shall see. I'll sing of salvation at home and abroad, till many shall hear the truth and trust in God. A song in my soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. This morning we come to the story of the rich man in Hades, often called the rich man in Lazarus. Some scholars believe it's a true story. They say this in part because it's the only story of Jesus in, in which a person is named. However, some details cannot be literally true. For example, the rich man no longer has a body, so how can he feel physical pain? So some believe it was just a, a parable, like another parable that Jesus told. And some believe that Jesus adapted a story told by the religious leaders. There are similar stories found in the documents from that time. And so I believe that Jesus adapted one of their own stories to make a point against them. Whether Jesus invented this parable or adapted it, we will see at the end of the parable, Jesus' main point is clear. What's not so clear is the significance of the details. Are they just part of the story leading up to the end, or do they actually shed light on what happens immediately after we die? In this parable, I believe Jesus did give us a glimpse beyond the grave. In it we find information that's not found elsewhere in the Bible, but that information does fit with what we learn in other scriptures. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. We begin with a stark contrast between two men. 
The one was rich in this world's goods. His clothing was brightly colored and soft to the touch. He ate well. Actually, he feasted every day. Jesus didn't say that the rich man was sinful. I think we're supposed to understand that from the fact that he had more than enough to feed the man outside his gate and didn't do so. The poor man's name was Lazarus. That's the same as the brother of Mary and Martha. It's the New Testament version of the Old Testament name Eliezer. His name means God has helped. Lazarus was desperately poor. He was unhealthy, covered in sores. He was so hungry he would have gladly eaten the bits that fell on the floor. But he was outside the gate, apparently friendless, apart from the dogs that licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes, lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Most of Jesus' parables use people and things in this life to explain spiritual truths. But most of this parable didn't happen in this life. We're expected to use our imaginations in this parable. Jesus described two men whose dead bodies were still in the earth as if they had physical bodies in a physical place. The reality is that immediately after death, before the resurrection to judgment, these men wouldn't have physical bodies. They would be souls or spirits in the realm of the dead. So what about the physical comfort and the physical suffering? Well, those are there for the sake of the parable too, since these men don't have bodies. However, these pictures of physical comfort and pain described in this parable point to the reality of spiritual or mental comfort or pain that they would experience between death and the resurrection to final judgment. Notice that Lazarus is with Abraham in a place that is unnamed while the rich man is in Hades. These places are pictured as visible to each other and across a distance or as two parts of the same place. The poor man was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. And Jesus knew that his listeners would understand that he was now in a place of blessing. This good part of Hades is not named here, but was called paradise by Jesus when he spoke to the thief on the cross. And we typically call it heaven. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish in this flame. Now again, we have to use our imaginations. The rich man spoke to Abraham, who had been buried centuries before, as if they were close enough to see each other and communicate with each other. He spoke of being in physical pain and wanting physical relief, even though he had no body. So the reality is that such a conversation between Abraham and the rich man wouldn't take place. In the parable, their dialogue teaches us a great deal. But in reality, we shouldn't expect that after unrighteous people die, they will be able to plead or argue with Abraham or even Jesus. Jesus invented this dialogue to make his point. While Lazarus was being comforted by the father of the Jews, the rich man was experiencing anguish. And he asked that Abraham send Lazarus over to him. His request was for just a bit of water to help alleviate his suffering. Well, the flames cannot represent physical suffering and the water cannot represent physical relief. But the flames do picture real suffering, emotional, mental, spiritual suffering for those who do not repent and receive salvation from Jesus. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. I think we're meant to understand that the rich man pursued wealth at the expense of righteousness and compassion. 
he chose to enjoy the comforts of this life, even to the point of cruelty to Lazarus. Now Jesus didn't say that the poor man was a righteous man. In the parable, it's enough that he's poor and that God helps the poor. After all, his name is Lazarus, God has helped. In reality, getting into paradise won't be as simple as being poor. Being poor can be the result of sin. It can cause people to be angry with God. But sometimes being poor makes us open to trust God. And I think that's how we're meant to see Lazarus. For the sake of the parable, he was the one that God had helped. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. According to Abraham, it was absolutely impossible for someone to go from one side to the other. I don't think Jesus meant us to think that we'll be able to communicate across the chasm. Again, what was said in this conversation was to make the point that no one can go from one side to the other. In other words, our choices in this life are final. Hades isn't a place where you can come to your senses and get another chance to do better. And he said, I, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Since Lazarus could not alleviate his suffering, the rich man wanted Lazarus to warn his brothers. Now clearly his brothers were also rich and also cared little about those who were suffering. So why didn't the rich man ask permission to go himself? I think he knew already that he would not be allowed to go. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Abraham didn't even say whether or not Lazarus would be allowed to go. Now we know that in real life, another Lazarus did return from the dead at Jesus' command. But he didn't return to warn anyone. Instead, Abraham simply stated, that the brothers had Moses and the prophets, meaning they had the word of God, the Old Testament, meaning they didn't need Lazarus to warn them. However, the rich man knew that during his own lifetime he had had access to the Old Testament scriptures himself. Clearly he hadn't paid attention to the scripture, and so he argued with Abraham. And Abraham responded, he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The rich man's thinking was simple. His brothers would repent if only someone came back from the dead and went to them and warned them. But Abraham told him bluntly that if his brothers wouldn't hear Moses and the prophets, if they wouldn't pay attention to the Old Testament, God's word, then they would not believe if someone returned from the dead. And I think we know that. Miracles don't impress people who have already decided what they want to believe. They can dismiss a miraculous healing as something that would have happened anyway. They can explain a miraculous escape from death as just being lucky. They could explain a person returned from the dead as a hallucination. Well, the rich man was confident that his brothers would listen to someone who came back from the dead, and Abraham contradicted him, saying, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And that was the main point of Jesus' parable. So who was Jesus talking to and about? You'll remember that Jesus talked about money in the first half of this chapter. And in verse 14, Luke wrote that the Pharisees loved money and they ridiculed Jesus. 
So Jesus' parable about a rich man in Hades was directed particularly to the Pharisees, the religious leaders. And yet what he said was also true of all those who refused to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus was telling the religious leaders and all who were listening that if they refused to pay attention to Moses and the prophets, meaning what we call the Old Testament, they wouldn't be convinced if someone rose from the dead. Almost all of his listeners were the people of Israel, people who had grown up with those same Old Testament scriptures. And the religious leaders, in particular, knew those scriptures well. They knew the predictions of the coming Messiah, predictions that started in the Garden of Eden, in chapter 3 of Genesis, when God told Eve that her seed would crush the head of the serpent. When Jesus came as the Messiah or the Christ, he spent much of his three and a half years calling Israel to repentance, calling them to follow him as the one who fulfilled the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. When Jesus told this parable, he knew he was going to be crucified and rise from the dead, and he knew that his rising from the dead would not result in all those religious leaders repenting of their sin, especially the sin of rejecting him. And he knew that his rising from the dead would not result in masses of Israelites turning from their sin and accepting him as Messiah. In fact, as Luke will tell us in Acts chapter 2, the ones who responded to the gospel after the resurrection were the Jews from far away, Jews who spoke other languages, not those to whom Jesus had been preaching all along. Those who had a heart to serve God welcomed Jesus when he came. Those who were focused on themselves had no real desire to follow Jesus. And that's the way it is today. Those of us who have repentant hearts and a longing to be right with God, we welcome the resurrection of Jesus as proof that he can change our lives and help us in our struggle to please God. For those who aren't interested in serving God, even the fact of a man resurrected from the dead is not enough to move them to repent. And that's the main point of the parable. Not long ago, I might have said that Jesus told this whole parable just to make that main point. But now I think it is more likely we're expected to learn other truths from the parable. What other truths was Jesus teaching? Luke wrote that the Pharisees loved money, and Jesus took one of their stories and altered it to explain the deadly danger of loving money. The rich man was judged for his lack of compassion and lack of love for the beggar, who was, after all, another son of Abraham. Jesus wanted his audience and us to know there's judgment coming for our sin. And Jesus wanted us to know that after we die, it's too late to change our minds. And from Jesus' main, main point, we can learn also this. We are expected to believe God's word. We're expected to learn from God's word. We're expected to get our growth and our strength from God's Word and to measure our faith in what we're taught by God's Word. Now, God does graciously give us miracles from time to time. God did raise the other, other Lazarus, after all. But we shouldn't be expecting miracles and manifestations to reinforce or reinvigorate our faith. Instead of looking for miracles, we're expected to believe the Bible. A few weeks ago, we looked at the subject of life after this life, and I based what I said in part on this chapter of Luke. And I think it's important to go over the main points again. The average person believes that when they die, they will go to heaven. That's what we usually call it. Where good people sit on clouds and play harps, and that bad people will go straight to hell. If they mean that after 
we die after they die, the righteous people, that they will live forever in a wonderful place while the wicked will be punished in a dreadful place, then they have the gist of it. However, that's an oversimplification. On the other side of death, we will at first have no bodies. We'll be in the place of the dead, which the Greeks called Hades. There will be a bad part, but that won't be the final end of the wicked. Hades is not hell. And there will be a good part, which Jesus called paradise. In Luke 23, 43, he spoke to the thief on the cross who believed him. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. But paradise is not the final end of the righteous, of those who have been made righteous by faith in Jesus. We have a much greater blessing coming to us. The chasm in between means there will be no opportunity to change our minds after we die. Let's also be clear that this bad part of Hades is not purgatory. Purgatory is a word and a concept that doesn't even exist in the Bible. The rich man was not suffering to pay for his sins so that eventually he could live on the new earth in a resurrected body along with the righteous. On the contrary, he would eventually be resurrected to face judgment and the second death. Since the rich man was suffering in Hades, we might wonder if, well, could Hades be really just another word for hell? And if we had the King James Version, and that was all we had, we might think so. The idea that Hades is hell comes from a mistranslation in the KJV. And I can prove it from the KJV. In Revelation 20, verse 14, the King James Version reads, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Well, that's confusing because we've been taught that the lake of fire is hell. So how can the lake of fire be cast into the lake of fire? Or how can hell be cast into hell? So Revelation 20, verse 14 in the KJV doesn't make sense. And the problem, as I mentioned before, is that the KJV uses the English word hell to translate several Greek words, including the Greek word Hades, which refers to the place of the dead. The English Standard Version does better. In Revelation 20, verse 14, it is Hades that's cast into the lake of fire. In other words, death and the place of the dead are thrown into the lake of fire. Now, even if we don't understand exactly what that means, at least it does make sense. Notice that the ESV keeps the distinction. And like the, the KJV, it does use hell to translate Jesus' word Gehenna, which is not found in this verse. But almost always, the ESV leaves untranslated this Greek word, Hades. Abraham and Lazarus and the rich man had yet to experience resurrection. They had yet to experience the final judgment. And yet Abraham and Lazarus were in paradise. And the rich man was in that bad part of Hades. So it seems these men have been judged already. Could it be that bliss or punishment begins before the final judgment? I think it does. I think it could be. In fact, I think it's something we learn from this parable. God knows already the result of the final judgment. We read in Acts chapter 24, verse 15, there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous. And so eventually, after some period of time, we don't know how long, everyone who has died will be resurrected we will all face the great white throne judgment. Those who believe in Jesus will be judged as righteous, and those who do not will be judged as unrighteous or wicked. We won't spend forever without bodies. We won't spend forever sitting on clouds playing harps. Not that there's anything wrong with harps, or clouds for that matter. It's just that popular idea is inaccurate. According to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, 
being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. And according to John, we will be given a new earth to live on. In Revelation 21, verse 1, he wrote, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. When Jesus returns, we will be given resurrected bodies, we meaning those who have received Jesus as Savior. And we will live on a new earth. And according to Revelation 21, verse 4, it will be a world with no death. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. In a world with no death, we will live forever. That's eternal life. We who have received Jesus as Savior have been forgiven our sins. We will receive eternal life and live on a new earth with perfect bodies. The wicked will be cast into what Jesus called Gehenna, what we usually call hell, and what appeared to John in his vision as a lake of fire. He said that this is the second death. The second death is opposite of eternal life. Notice that both the righteous and the unrighteous will be raised from the dead. The righteous for a new life forever on a new earth, and the wicked for a judgment called the second death. So where will you and I go immediately after we die? Jesus was giving a warning to the rich spiritual leaders and all those who are listening. If we have been careless or disinterested in spiritual things, then we have far too much in common with the rich man. We will find ourselves suffering because of our sins. We need to repent before it's too late. For those who have repented of their sin and who now believe in Jesus, we will not suffer the fate of the rich man. Instead, we will be blessed like Lazarus. We'll be in a place that Jesus called paradise in the presence of God. Facing death, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.8, We are of good courage. We would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. He was facing persecution. And he understood that in God's time, Jesus will come again. Everyone will be resurrected. Those of us who believe to eternal life and those who do not believe, they will face the punishment of the second death. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this chapter which gives us these details. We've always known that you would grant eternal life to believers. And we're concerned about certain family members or friends who don't believe, who don't know your son Jesus as Savior. So this morning we pray for them in Jesus' name, asking that you would draw them to yourself. Amen.
This is Pastor David Richardson again. Thank you for listening to this YouTube version of our Sunday service. We would be delighted to have you join our Sunday services in person. The sermons are live versions of what you've just heard, usually verse-by-verse -verse teaching from the Bible. Our live worship is much more dynamic in person. It is thoughtfully and prayerfully planned and led by our worship leader, Sylvie Copland, with the help of our praise team. Please consider this your invitation to join us, if you are able. Thank you.